unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verses 5. The Bible says in 17, 5, That saith the Lord. That saith who? He says, That saith the Lord. Cast be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. Praise God. And whose heart departeth from the Lord. And the next verse says, For he shall be like the heath in the, desert, in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the patched places in the wilderness. Oh my God, far from me. In a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man, somebody say, that trusteth in the Lord. And whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. Somebody shout hallelujah. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the hour of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Underline that word, yielding fruit. The Bible says that man shall not cease from yielding fruit. He shall not cease from yielding fruit. That man or woman shall not see when heat comes. Somebody shout hallelujah. Her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the hour of drought. He will not prepare. Oh, drought is coming. Let me do this. Oh, there's something coming. I have to prepare myself. Oh, this is coming. If I don't do this, I'm in trouble. Oh, this is coming. Oh, the heat is coming. When they say, oh, the, the heat is too much. And then when your trust is in the Lord, he says, you don't even worry about what happens. When they saw the dollar went up, you don't worry. Because your blessing is not in dollars. Somebody shout hallelujah. When they say plague has hit a nation, you don't fear. Because you know none of those plagues shall come anywhere near you. Somebody shout hallelujah. When they say poverty is in the land, you feel sorry for the people, not you. You will not be careful in your year of drought, he says. And neither shall you cease from yielding fruit. That means whether it's working elsewhere or it's not working for you, he said, surely it shall what? Work. The writer is drawing a very clear dichotomy, very clear difference between a man that trusteth in the Lord and a man that trusteth in flesh, in the flesh, in the arm of flesh. The Bible says that cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh his flesh his arm. He maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. You see, when you put your trust in the arm of flesh, right? When you put your trust in your ability, sometimes some people think when you're talking of putting your trust in man, some people think it's only trust in another man. No. Sometimes it is trust in your human ability. And that's what I want to touch about tonight. Because sometimes, yes, we may not put trust in men. We may not put trust in the arm of flesh of men. But then we put trust in our own ability and trust in our own flesh. Somebody shout hallelujah. This also concerns you. This scripture concerns you. He said you're cursed. That means you put yourself under mayhem when you put your trust in yourself or in man. That does not mean that God will not send people to help you. Don't get this wrong. I've seen immature people become so pompous and arrogant. Of I don't need his help. I don't need her help. That's not what we're talking about. You need all the help you can get when God has sent somebody to help you. Somebody shout hallelujah. But it's another thing when you put your trust in the arm of flesh. When you think that God is not able to save you than another man. That's where my issue is tonight. And there are also people who are sent to help you, but they are not in line with God. They are not of God. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. They are not sent by the spirit of God to be of help to you. They can only destroy you. God will send people in this world to be of help to you. God will send people in this world to be of advantage to you. God will send people in this world to give to you. He said, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. He says, shall men give to your bosom? He will send men to give you. If you trust in him, men will bless you. If you trust in him, men will serve you. If you trust in him, men will do anything for you. If you trust in him, but it begins with trusting in him, not trusting in men. There are many people who are struggling with trusting in man and flesh. And like I said, sometimes it's not in the other man. Sometimes it's in the self. But the Bible says, but these things were written afar for your learning. That through comfort and patience, you might obtain what? Hope. There are things in scripture and some of which I'm going to show you this evening. But these things are all to the end that you will learn something. In the world of men. Somebody shout hallelujah. Let me read for you a very interesting story. Now in the book of Samuel. We're introduced to a very interesting idea. And story. That I'm going to go around for a long time in this sermon tonight. But with the intent. That you'll understand God's mind in what it means to trust in the arm of flesh or in man. Sometimes not necessarily the other, but yourself. And then you forget the ability, the power, the potential, and the intent of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now you all know that the children of Israel at one particular point, Found themselves in a very un unhealthy compromise. And sad to say, they go to God and they say, give us a king like other nations. Somebody shout hallelujah. God was their king. God was above them. They were okay and should have been okay having Jehovah God as their leader. But they said, uh -uh. we also want to be like the other nations. Give us a king that he may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And then God warns them. He says, if you get kings, they'll enslave your children. They'll take everything you have. They'll take all your property. They'll manipulate you. They'll use you. They'll do this and they'll do that. And the people of God say, no, we want the arm of flesh to judge us. We want the arm of flesh to rule over us. We want the man a man in flesh to be our king. Why? Because you're invisible. They have a visible entity that can be seen. He walks like kings. He sits like a king. His royalty, he's everything beautiful. He represents the sovereignty of a people. The identity of men can be alluded to him. He looks like he can fight for us. They insist. This is men. Asking God to be given flesh. And what happens? God enters the hearts of these people. And he knows. He sees that they are asking. For more than their words are saying. Do you know it's possible to ask for more than you can say? Do you know it's possible to say one thing. But then imply more deeply another thing. Unintentionally or intentionally. Somebody said hallelujah. Now these are telling God you know what? For us, we need a king. We need somebody. We need flesh and blood to judge us. We need flesh and blood to rule over us. We need flesh and blood to serve, to do all. He wants them. He tells them, you're in, you're, you are opening up a can of worms. You are going to expose yourself to destruction. And they say, uh-uh. He tells them, your children will be taken for captive. Uh-uh. They will take off your property. No, we want a king. And true to form, because God knows and sees more than what they see. It was clear that their trust was in the leadership of a king than God. Who had ruled them, led them, provided for them, and been with them all through their lives. Now the scriptures tell us, and again as I'm sharing, I know... Many of you are like, yeah, those people were bad. No, as I'm sharing, you're going to realize that some of you are worse than they are. In 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verses 1, 
The Bible says, and there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Betorat, the son of Apia, a Benjamite, a Benjamite, sorry, a mighty man. He was a mighty man. Apia was a mighty man. Okay? And the next verse says, and he had a son. And whose name was? So, was Saul's father weak? No, he was a mighty man. Of course, later we read in scripture that when they put this demand on Saul, he says, how can you do that to a man who comes from the least tribe and the least family? Yes, the lineage was small, the tribe was small, but his immediate father family was big. A peer, the Bible says, was a mighty man. Praise the Lord. That's what the scripture says. He was a mighty man. And he had a son whose name was Saul. The Bible says he was a choice young man and goodly. And there was not a man, listen, the children of Israel are goodlier person than he. From his shoulders upward, he was higher than any of the people. When you looked at Saul, Saul was taller than any man of his own people. From a, yes, the tribe was small, the family lineage was small, but the immediate family. His father, Pia, was big. He was, a big. he was a mighty man. Not big in the body, but he was a mighty man. Right? He was a mighty man. He must have been a rich man. He must have been a popular man. He must have been a successful man. And so, you know, God knows exactly what they want. He gets that kind of man. He, take, he says, because he's higher than any man in the shoulder, I know your picture is of a certain guy who is mighty. He's big. He, he has something about him. He has a charisma. You look at him and you say, hmm, this guy looks kingly. Are you following what I'm saying? And guess what? The Hebrew word for soul, the Hebrew pronounce him as Shaul, it means desired. He was the desired of men. He was the desired of men. When, when you ask the man, what would you desire of a man to rule you? He, he was what a man would desire. But we're talking about the desire of the flesh. We're not talking about the desire of the spirit. We're talking about the desire of the flesh. So you know what God does? He gets a man who is above the shoulders of every, every, any man. Very tall fellow. Goodly looking. He has every attribute. He already looks like a king before. Are you hearing me? And then God says, you know what? This is the king. And all of them pay homage and respect. They celebrate and... They are full of relations. Why? Because they've gotten the kind. When you looked at Saul, according to scripture, even you, you'd said, but mm -mm, this is the guy. Are you hearing me? And it's so amazing, like you all know, how deceptive looks can be. How deceptive the outward appearance can be. Because that's how men see things. That's how human beings see things. They always judge with what's outside. That's why some people are not happy. Because they made the wrong choices. <laughs> are you following what I'm saying? Because it's not the leading of God. It's not the leading of God. You, you, you thought that that was the best job because of how it looked and how the employees looked like. Now you're in trouble. You thought this was the perfect person and now you're in trouble. You thought this was a perfect business. Why? Because of what looked outside. Do you know how many people in Uganda, for example, have been duped with fake minerals? A guy brings something shining. They said, this thing is worth a million dollars. Woo! Give me what you have. They give it for the exchange of cheap stuff. Stuff that cannot even cost anything. Why? Because it's easy to deceive men by what they see. Than the inward conscience. Somebody shout hallelujah. Than the inward witness, the supernatural leading of God. When you become born again, you learn to look from within to out. You stop looking from without to within. No, you start looking from within to without. Nothing outside defines you. Nothing outside defines for you. Every definition begins from inside and goes out. Men might judge you for your choices. Men might judge you for your ways. Men might judge you for your going in and your going out. But if you've, they've not seen what you've seen inside, it's their problem, not yours. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. So God gives them what they want. How they want it. A man higher than anybody. Bigger than anybody. Who looks presentable. There is a height that could not be king in Israel that time. Are you following what I'm saying? But God was not in there. It was the arm of flesh. Trusting the arm of flesh. Because they had carnal desire. Somebody shout hallelujah. The man God gave them as king. Also had the same mentality. He comes as king. You know he examines the hearts of men. He knows exactly what you want. He also gives you a man. Gives them a man. Who has the same heart. Same understanding. Same interpretation of life. First Samuel chapter 14 and 52. When Saul becomes king. The Bible says there was, a, there was so war that there was much war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. That means for as long as Saul existed, there was never a time Philistines never attacked the Israelites or the Israelites ever never attacked the Philistines. There was always war between these two. So war. The word they saw is very massive. It was very aggressive. It was a big war. It wasn't a small war. So he says, um, there was so war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And the same man of the same mentality, the Bible says, when Saul saw any strong man, the Bible says, oh, any valiant man, he took him unto him. Whenever he looked big and strong, Saul saw an army man in you. And he took them immediately. The guy higher than everybody, the guy who looks bigger than anybody, and he's the same man with the same mentality. When he wants to get an army, he doesn't look into the hearts of the men to war. He looks at the size of these men to war. He thinks in his heart that if you have the big man, you have the big sized man, you have the man of ability, you have a guy who looks exactly like an army man, then that means you have a strong army man. Listen, armies are not built by strong men. Armies are built by men who have strong hearts. The brevity of a heart is stronger than the brevity of a body. There are people who look so big up here, but they are very little small boys. And there are people who are small like this, but oh boy, they are big. Somebody shout hallelujah. There is nothing I found so amazing. Like my name goes so ahead of many, many a time. And then I meet some people for the first time. And then you, they tell him, this is Apostle Grace. Ding! you Apostle Grace. I love that statement. May God put something on you that doesn't look like your skin color, that doesn't look like your weight, your size, your education, your employment, your... Hey! And I proudly tell him, yeah. Why? Brethren, consider your calling. Consider all your calling. That is why it's so hard for some of us to be proud. Man, we know where we are coming from. Some of us know. He says, brethren, for you see your calling that not many of you are wise after the flesh. Not many of you are mighty. Not many of you are noble. But the Bible says he calls and chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. Do you know the very reason why God is going to use you? It's because you see weakness in you. Wherever, you see, when you wake up and say, hey, God, mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have to be using me. I mean, really. <laughs> You're the very reason why God won't use you. Somebody shout Hallelujah. There are people who go and look in the mirror and they say, I have to get married. <laughs> Some things that don't cook. <laughs> Woo! Glory. But are you following what I'm saying? Some people go for interviews, job interviews. And then you look at the guy, the way he has cut his beard. 
Only the beard can hire him. He just says, good morning. And then, wow, come and work tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said hallelujah. It's not what you see outside. Tell your neighbor, it's not what you see outside. It's not what it looks like. It's what it is within. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, Saul looks for the biggest man. He looks for the strongest man. And he says, these are my army. And God does to Saul the typical thing that I've seen happen with every man with that mentality. He gets a bigger man. One time they wake up and there's a champion of the Philistine. This guy was taller than anything Saul could ever choose. He was bigger than anything Saul could ever look for. And guess what? The man was against him, not for him. God would not have raised that same man in Israel. Because he knows the heart of Saul. He knows the foundation of how Israel is built. He knows their mentality. He knows how they think. He says, okay, if you ever, ever put yourself on the pedestal of how big and mighty, God will always prove to you that there is one bigger and mightier. Somebody said hallelujah. There will always be someone better when you put yourself on the advantage of better. There will always be somebody who does it better than you do. That person will always exist. That he will rob you of that pride. And the thought that because you have this big thing. And that is why he warns us on the blessing. He says a man can be blessed and honored by God. And then he gets to a point and he forgets that same God. And then he starts to say, my wisdom and my skill brought me here. It's typical. That when the Lord was raising this individual, they were humble, they were hard workers, they were everything. And when they start to see glory around them, they say, mm. they say in their heart, that's me. He says, remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto you by his fathers as it is this day. Somebody shout Hallelujah. He didn't want you to get to a point where one day you become so wealthy physically because you're already wealthy spiritually. And then you start to say, you know what? If it wasn't he, I would not. No, no. It doesn't matter how high, how big you'll ever be. Always remember to give glory to God for the fire he has brought you. Never forget that he is the one who began that thing and he'll see to accomplish the day, the day of Christ. I always tell people, they always talk about the knocking of the door and they don't know that they would have gotten there and there was no door, there was a wall. What would you have done? Oh, he that seeketh shall, shall find. But he created the portal for you to seek. Somebody shout hallelujah. So we wake up in the morning and there's a Philistine. Goliath is in existence. The Bible calls him the champion. Of the Philistine. And one day. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 17. He stood and cried unto the armies of Israel. That was who? Goliath. And said unto them. Why you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul. Choose you a man for you. And let him count down to me. If he'd been able to fight with me and kill me. Then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him. Then shall ye be our servants and servants. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, the Bible says they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Why? A bigger one had come. Are you following what I'm saying? Typical of people who put trust in flesh. Every time you put trust in flesh, you open up for a stronger man. You open a door for a stronger man. If he's without you, he'll exert more power over you. If you are desperate on the hand of a man by 20%, the more you trust in that man, the more God will even create more need for you to seek for a stronger man if he's not stronger than your need. That is why some of you without debt, you can't exist. 
Without a man's hand, you cannot eat food. Without somebody's grace, you can't sleep. Without somebody's favor, you cannot live anywhere. Some of you, your life is in balance. It's based on one man's decision. If that man or woman wakes up in the morning and makes a subtle decision against you, your life can make a turnaround in just days and people would look at you and not be able to identify you. And the more you put your trust in men, the more men God brings, allows, he doesn't bring, but he lets it happen. Satan sends more. God just lets it happen. Why? Because you decided to put your trust in man and not God. Do you know that there are people in this world who if certain people did not exist, they would not be alive? Because literally, without them, they cannot eat a meal. And they have God. They have God. And how do you know? It's by how much you beg. Begging is a spirit. Begging is a spirit. Do you know there are people who just live and I'm not saying that the, no, there's a difference between begging and men giving you. There are men who are given. There are men who are given before they ask and there are men who have to beg. There are people, if you don't beg somebody, you will not eat. Nothing happens in your life if you don't put your trust on a certain man's hand. Because you think if you don't beg, you're not going to eat. That's how little faith you have in God. So who is your faith in? It's in that man who feeds you. It's in the fact that if you don't ask that brother for food tonight, you're not going to eat. If you are in that kind of situation, tonight God has to deliver you. I came for you. I came for you. We, you cannot live on the hand of a man. No. God can and shall and has done everything that you need that pertains to life and godliness. But it's through a certain knowledge. And that's where we're going. The Philistine defies the army of Israel. He tells them, uh -uh, somebody, bring anybody who is strong. And look at the irony of God. The biggest and most strongest people you know existing, all flee. The Bible says they used to hear that Goliath is in the place and they start running away. The Bible says they used to flee. The moment they hear Goliath is here, they don't even care. No, they just start running away. But remember, the mightiest, the biggest, once they hear Goliath is in the place, uh, until the king has to put a contest, who is the strongest man to deal with this fellow? I'll give him this, I'll give him that. Because every man who was strong physically was timid. And there's this little, little boy. <laughs> He's looking after sheep. His father's sheep. That day he had not planned for fight. Uh -uh. The Bible says, so ironically, he was the youngest. He was a young boy. He did not have skill in war. He was a shepherd. Looking after his father's sheep. Three of his elder brothers were in the army. They should have been big boys. This was a little small teenage boy. He did not prepare. He was never trained. He didn't know how to handle a spear. He didn't know how to handle a sword. Nothing. That day of victory, he went to serve food. And he found a convinced lot. A confused lot. But convinced that they could do nothing. He asked them what's going on. Oh my goodness. Have you considered? There's this giant. Da, 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 da. They narrate the story. And the man with the heart of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. He walks to the king. And he tells him, my Lord, it is a small thing. See, you, you must understand when you claim to be the seed of David. You must know it's more than just a name. It's a character of spirit. It's an experience and a revelation in your heart of who God is. The guy goes to the king. When he said, I'll fight this guy. So, again, the mentality. <laughs> he tells the boy, 33. Saul says to David, because of the mentality, he says, thou art not able 
He told him, you don't have the ability to go against this Philistine, to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. Bananga, listen to that. Did you hear that? You are young. For him, he has been fighting since you were young. So literally, your age for him was the beginning of war. That means he beats you up square by the body. He beats you up square by his experience and skill. He will kill you. And then you start to realize the only reason why Israel was in bondage to the Philistine spirit. It was this one thing. Saul's mentality about how God gives victory. He looks at his men and realizes none is able to do. A young man with the right heart comes. With the right attitude comes. With the right revelation and experience comes. With the right God and covenant comes. And he says, uh-uh, you're still too young. You're youth. You don't have the ability. And the next verse says, David opens his eyes. He said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear. He took a lamb out of the flock and I went out after him. Now, I want you to envision a young man chasing chasing a lion or a bear. Brave heart somebody. How imagine this small little guy chasing after a wild animal. He says, I went out after him and smote him. And I delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. That's the guy you're dealing with. That's the guy you're dealing with. He might be small, but he has done things. She might be small, but that's the heart she has. And the next verse says, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Listen, when David says this uncircumcised Philistine, David is trying to tell you that from beginning to the end, his proof of victory, his guarantee of victory is a covenant issue. That's what David is trying to tell you. David is saying, that it doesn't matter whether you are the most educated or not. You have a covenant. It does not matter whether you're the most exposed or not. You have a covenant. It doesn't matter whether you're the wisest or not. You have a covenant. It does not matter whether they love you or they don't love you. You have a covenant. It doesn't matter whether you look presentable or you don't look presentable. You have a covenant. It doesn't matter whether you're tall or short. You have a covenant. It does not matter whether they have more resumes. They have a bigger plan. They, they have lived it longer. They have done this consultancy business for more than 30 years. You have a covenant. That's what David is trying to tell them. He's coming with sword and spear. He's using javelin and power. I'm coming in a covenant. He was so cautious of the covenant he had toward God. That when a lion got an animal, any of his, he would chase after it. Because he has a covenant with God that can't get him killed under the hand of a lion. When you understand that, no diagnosis can scare you. When you understand that, no newspaper can scare you. When you understand that, no media line can scare you. No link can scare you. No persecution can scare you. No word can scare you. Why? Because you didn't get up by the word. You were not raised by a newspaper. You were not raised by connections. You were not raised by education. You were not raised by their power. You were not. Listen, you have a covenant. Tell somebody. And that same covenant has brought you this far. When you understand that covenant, they'll see you running into a train. And the power on you would stop it. Because you have a covenant. Think of the boldness of a young man getting the beard of a wild animal. And if you check in David, there is no ounce of fear. That is why I told people the New Testament 
is more than just a testimony. It is a life that gives you boldness. That when men see the things you do, the way you do things, they simply say, this is a woman with a covenant. You're not afraid to go for the biggest deals. Why? Because you have a covenant. You're not afraid to sit on the biggest tables. It doesn't matter how you don't get intimidated because these people know. You sit there and you know greater is he which is in me than he that is in the world. That's the attitude. Guess what? Saul is pointing to the ability of Goliath. David is pointing to the ability of God in his life because he is persuaded. In fact, David means the beloved. He, he is a man who has been so persuaded by love. Now I know why the Bible says we are persuaded. We are persuaded that nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ. Not things present. Not things to come. Not disease. Not death. Not pestilence. He says nothing. No height. No depth. No creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. David is a man who has understood how much God loves him. Saul is a man who is after the desire of the flesh and his ability. David is a man whose trust and faith is in God and full convicted of the love of God toward him. You get to a point where you know God loves me too much to let me die. God loves me too much to let me fail. He loves me too much. He loves me too much. Christians, there's only one end in the Bible. It is the end of the Lord. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? He says we've seen the suffering and the patience of our brother Job and have seen the end of the Lord. There's only one end of a Christian. It is called the Lord. There is only one leading of the believer. It's the water. He leadeth you. He leads you. He says, who of you has released that animal? And taketh, him not, taketh it not to the water. He can lead you to the water. When it comes to circumstances, God never leads Christians to circumstances. No. God leads Christians through. When it came to fire, he says, when you go through. He didn't say when you go to the fire. He says, when you go through fire. I'll be with you. He didn't, he, when you go through waters, those, the, the ones that are, are sinking, he says, I will be with you. The sinking ones, the ones against. The value of the shadow of death, it's not something you go into. It's something you go through. Tell your neighbor, I'll go through this. You don't need to tell them what. No, the shadow of death was just a way through to your next level, to your next destination. It was a way through. It wasn't a way into. You can't die there. Somebody shout hallelujah. The waters that could drown you are just waters you go through. The ones you drink that God gets you to, they don't drown you. They don't drown you. They're not against you. Whatever God leads you to can't kill you. And whatever looks like can kill you, he can only lead you through. I hope you understood what I just said. I hope you understood what I just said. Whatever looks like it can kill you, he can only lead you through. And whatever can't kill you, and is for you, he can only lead you to. So, don't worry. Tell anybody it will end. Some of you don't understand what it means to go through until you imagine <laughs> that you're going through a wall. That the things you're going through, they don't look like you can go through, but you will go through. That when you land the other side, they will all ask themselves, how did he go through? Because you know the covenant you're under. He said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. When you get in an issue where you need my help, I am your ever-present help in time of need. The moment you say, God, I need help, I'm there. I don't, you don't call me. Christians don't call Jesus when they need help. No, they must know. 
if you need help, is there. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Your heart must convince yourself with such things. You see something coming, you close your eyes, you go through. Another one comes, you close your eyes. This one looks, some of you go back to your ability. Can my flesh hit a wall? Oh, you're reasoning, you're reasoning. Can my head go through a brick wall? You're reasoning. Don't you understand what I'm saying? This is not a reasoning issue. It's not an ability issue. It's a faith issue. It's a covenant issue. You will go through. You just close your eyes and ah, 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 ah. Don't put your trust in your arm of flesh. Your flesh can't. He said, I can do all things. Oh. Through Christ, we strengthen you. Same mentality. Same mentality. Same mentality. Same mentality. David tells this man, look, you don't know who you're playing with. You're dealing with a crazy man. You're dealing with a guy who has killed animals and these things. Saul still doesn't get it. He gives him his armor. Put it on. Get the sword. Get the best. At least you die in it. We'll be able to explain people. And the boy says, look, I can't put it on. I've not proved it. I know who I've proved. Hey, and then you're singing the song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to keep my eyes. Listen to those words. Just to rest upon. Just to know. That say, sing the chorus. Jesus, Jesus, how I, uh -huh. how I, Tim, oh, I know. Did you hear that? Says praise. Oh, David had proved God. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And now they are giving him things. If David put on that armor that day, they would have killed him. Because he would have said, I don't have trust in who I've proved. Let me put my trust in what another man who has proved it cannot still go in it. Saul is telling this guy to put on an armor. Even him, he can't go in it. But he thinks it's the next best thing to protect a man's body. To protect the man's person. And David said, uh-uh. I have not proved them. He put them off. And what happens? David kills a Philistine. Small little boy. And then he becomes the beloved of Saul. And the scriptures tell us, over time, Saul loved David, but in a funny love. And now, David goes through the same problem men who trust in God go through. One day, David wakes up, and Saul starts to hate David. He's jealous of David. Now, there's a scripture I read somewhere Saul feared. David saw greatly and he began to hate him. That means if a man hates you without cause, that man fears you. <laughs> if a man hates you without cause, that man fears you. If you see a brother or a sister who is envious of you, that brother or sister fears you. It's fear that led them. They, they have to fear you. Envy produces fear. It produces a certain hate. Some people just, you can find somebody that they just hate you. You say, but why does this? No, they fear you. You're a threat. Samuel, right? 1829, thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. 
Amplified. He says, Saul was still more afraid of David and Saul became David's constant enemy. Constant. But why was he an enemy to David? He feared him. He feared him. He feared him. He was a threat. Praise the Lord Jesus. Why? He saw that God was with the boy. Yeah, that's the Bible says. Saul more and more realized that God was with David. He, there are people who will fear you because you have God. Some of you are asking for the God. <laughs> but when it comes on you, some people will fear you. And when they fear you, they will hate you. Asking for more God means attracting more enemies. Constant ones. Welcome to the club. Praise God. But guess what? Some of us are just beginning. We are about to see God more. Somebody said hallelujah. That thing opened my eyes to something. That's why I can't envy a man. Because if I envy him, it means I fear him. That's why I can't hate a man. Because if I hate a man, it means I fear him. And there is no fear in love, David. The beloved of the Lord. He says, so perfect love. What does it do? It casteth out all fear. Now this man had been established in the love of God. The covenant he was in. He could face anybody or anything. Next thing we know, Saul starts to look for David's life. He starts to pursue David's life. He flees here, he goes, attacks him. He tries. He one time even plotted for the death of David. Two or three times. He wants David dead. Why? Because the threat. He kills 10,000 men. Women are singing. Saul kills 1,000. David kills 10,000. Whose enemies is he killing? Saul's enemies. Israel's enemies. For the sake of the kingdom. But when a man is afraid of you, he does not even know what you can do for him. Even what you do for him, he cannot appreciate. Because he's afraid of you. He will stay a constant enemy. You can look at how many things David did for Saul. But the heart of Saul still changed against the young man. Why? Because that's what the power of fear is. When a man has the fear of you, it doesn't matter how good you do for them. Every good for them is a threat to them. Even if you feed him, you're threatening him. Praise the Lord. And these things happened in scripture. But I want to drive you to something one day. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1. Again, as David is running from Saul, somebody said hallelujah. When David is running away from Saul, he departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house had it, they went down there. Now listen. <laughs> and everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, Everyone that was discontented, they gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them. And they were with him 400 men. The poorest, brokest, weakest, funniest guys. They all go to the same man. And you're like, but. None mighty. None stronger. They are indebted guys. They're running away from people who are funny, weak boys. They all run to this one man. And David finds himself. He looks through all the 400 men that he has to fight for him. And there is none with the ability and training and experience. When you have God a certain way, you don't worry the people God gives you. No. You can make them something. You can make them something. No. That's why I tell pastors, ask if you know who has called you, even if the poorest comes, you just clap your hands. Because you know that the thing coming out of you will give them bread. It will make them something. That's why I, mean, I don't worry about who comes to my ministry. I don't care how weak. I don't care how wicked this person. We tried everything. And there's a young man here. The parents told us that one we tried. to. We tried. Uh, who you? Now the guy is serving God. Because you know who is in you and the covenant you have. He says I shall make them strong. If men under the law, under Moses could not be feeble. How about men under grace? Somebody shout hallelujah. All these guys come unto what? David. Praise the Lord. And guess what? He didn't chase away any. Because in all of those men, he sees warriors. In all of those men, he sees the inner ability. He sees their hearts. While everybody's looking at the outside to think, uh, nothing can happen of these people. David sees what they can do. 
Because he's a man after God's own heart. He can see the heart of a man. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Verses 6. Now while he's hidden in Adullam the cave. The Bible says Saul heard that David was discovered. And the men that were with him. Saul was sitting in Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height. His spear in his hand and all his servants standing about him. Now listen again to the mentality. Saul said to his servants who stood about him. Here now you Benjamites. Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all commanders of thousands and hundreds? You see the mentality? What does David have? What can he give you? I can give you fields. I can make you commanders and captains of thousands. I can give you vineyards. What can David give you? Again, he's going back in what he has and what he thinks he has. And all his fools around him are serving him because of who he is and what he has. Guess what? Jonathan did not heed to his father. Why? Because he saw something in David way bigger than Saul. Mark you, the spirit had left Saul many years ago. The man he's pursuing is the real king. But he didn't look it outside. Are you seeing that? Again, the mentality. Will he give you vineyards? Will he, give, will he make you captains of hundreds? And the Bible says that all you've conspired against me, no one discloses to me when my son makes a league with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as he does this day. Anyway, he continues to pursue. Verses 24, chapter 24, First Samuel chapter 24, verses 1. Now Saul returned from following the Philistines that it, that it was told him again saying, now David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Now the Bible tells us, Saul took, again listen to the mentality, 3,000 chosen men. Remember this fellow has 400 losers. The message of that says, and then Saul took three companies, the best he could find in all Israel. And then he sent out in search of David and his men in the region of the wild goat rocks. He looked for the, he said, David is somewhere and get the best men, the strongest, the mightiest. He's going to attack a Kagai with 400 what? As truly as God is humorous. Eh? I love the next verse. Now the Bible says, he came to some sheep pens along the road and there was a cave there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. He went to relieve himself in a cave. And guess what? David and these men were huddled far back in this cave. Where is your trust? You have 3,000 men with you. But Satan leads you into the real trap. <laughs> because you're putting trust in them. So as ironic as God can be. And humorous. He leads the man to feel like relieving himself at the exact spot. He, he gives a man a cause, a biological cause to relieve himself. The man enters the cave and he doesn't know. David and all the 400 are in there, in the same cave. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, David's men whispered to him, can you believe it? This is the day God was talking about when he said, I'll put your enemy <laughs> in your hands. <laughs> He says, you can do whatever you want with him. Quiet as a cat. David crept up, cut off a piece of Saul's royal robe in the cave. But he said, uh-uh. I'll not do this to my master. Let me not touch the anointing. He later comes to him and tells him, you know what? I could have killed you. David is trying to tell you and I something. It's not about the army you have outside. It's about the God you have within. That day, David literally, God delivered the man to him. Let me tell you, some of you will see those days. Where those things and people that look like they are high and mighty. God will separate them from whatever they think gives them might. And they will want to relieve yourself in the space where you could destroy them. But don't touch them. Vengeance is of the Lord. But when you see those days, it shall be a time for you to remember that it's not about what you have outside. It's not about the army and the war. It's not about what they can carry. It's about the God you carry inside. Isaiah 31 verses 1 and 3. 
He says, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. Egypt means carnality. Egypt means the fleshly. Egypt means the arm of flesh. He says, and they stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many. And in the horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. And the Bible says, yet he also, God, is wise. And will bring even, and will not call back his words. But will arise against the house of the evildoers. And against the help of them that work iniquity. For now, for now, the Bible says, the Egyptians are men and not God. And their horses, flesh and not spirit. They are flesh and not spirit. Let me tell you, all you need and have is God. Stop putting your trust in the arm of flesh. It will kill you. It will destroy you. You position yourself under a curse. Those horses are not spirits. They are flesh. Those men are not God. God is God. He is your I am. Learn to trust. Learn to wake up and just say, you know what, God? If I have to have this, you lead a man to bless me. But I'm not going to look for a man to do this. Because you're my God. More than that, sometimes it's not what the trust we have in men. Sometimes it's the trust we have in the self. The gospel of the New Testament dispensation and the gospel of grace. Do you know why many people fight it? Because it rids you of yourself and puts trust entirely on God's working. That's why we preach grace. Because it takes you back to I cannot, but he can. He must increase, but I must decrease. I love that the Bible says, but I must decrease. His increase in me is entirely based on my deliberate plan and purpose to decrease. That's the way of the spirit. That's the mind of God. Now, I want to read for you a story because this guy wrote it for us to know. This guy is called Jean. He testifies that he was a slave to sin. Seeking short-term pleasures, though inwardly depressed. And he was seeking short-term pleasures. And he was inwardly depressed. His life was about women, alcohol. That he influenced his friends a lot, even on campus, to follow his way. He read all, listen, self-help books. And improved all areas of his life. But something was still missing. What was that something? He says it was a personal conviction and relationship with God. This is Jean Mark. He's giving a testimony. And he says he had observed this for a long time and realized he's tried everything. He put trust in his own flesh. He read every self-help to help himself. But every time he pointed within, his eyes were diverted from the power and intent of God on his life. And he comes to fellowship by a friend he observes an unexplainable peace and love in the life of the person who brought him. And that person kept inviting him. And when he came, he had the message. The message blew him. He gave his life to Christ. He says he's totally transformed. He was leading people into sin. But now he testifies. He every day leads men into Christ. You want to know why? He seized from the self and put his eyes on Christ. Some of you, it's not the people outside. No, some of you, it's yourself. Some of you, you trust so much in your ability, your eloquence, your power, your, your glory, in your own flesh and potential, individual, to go out. You will never make it. Why we preach grace every day is to tell men, we can't put trust in men, neither can we put trust in ourselves. Our trust is in the Lord. Learn to rest in the love of God that he has toward you. Because when you yield and give yourself to that love, you realize that God wants to change you more than you want to change you. You realize that God wants to help you more than any man could ever want to help you. But you must believe that he wants to and that he is able more than you are able. That is trusting in God. Learn to put your trust in God. He will never fail you. It's not about your education. It's not about how many networks you have. It's not about how many are at your side. 
It's not about how much educated you are. It's not about how beautiful you are. It's not about how, how much strong you think you are. Do you know there are people who are wicked because of the positions they have? And the positions they have are of men. They are not of God. Or if they are of God, then they view these positions as positions of men. That is why I tell people, when you have seen God a certain way, you humble. Because you get to the point of understanding that it will never be about your ability and your strength. But it is about the ability and strength of God. I want to talk to someone here who every time you look at yourself, you feel that you don't have enough for what you're believing God for. I came with good news for you. That is why you must believe in God. And that is why it's going to work for you. Because you're a man, you are a woman under a covenant. You're not a man or a woman under connections. And, and thank God that the things that you thought could have bailed you out have failed to bail you out. It's the very reason why God has led you to that place. He, he caused, the Bible says, you have caused our enemies to ride over us. There are things that will happen and then you start to see like, like things that are, are, are against you. They're, they're hitting you. The Bible says we went through fire and through water. But what was the end of that? But thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. That's the end of the Lord. The person who fired you is taking you into a wealthy place. The person who chucked you is taking you into a wealthy place. The visa that denied you is taking you into a wealthier place. Whatever. He says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Raise your voice and start to talk to God. Lord, my heart is yours. It all belongs to you. I give you all the glory. Yes, I love you. I worship and adore. I want to tell you more Oh Lord how much I really do love you And I love you Lord how I love you I love you Lord how I love you Somebody tell him you love him. Tell him, God, wherever I've put trust. Come on, talk to God. Talk to God. I want to tell you more. from your heart.
I'm, I'm a man under a covenant. Say it. I'm a woman under a covenant. I just have to lions and tear them up. I slay bears. I kill things bigger than me. Come on, say it. Hey! Hey! Thank you, Jesus. That our trust is in you. Our trust is in you. It's not in us. It's not in the people. It's in you. That if you should cause us, them, or anything, it's still you. It is still you. It is still you, God. And may we cease to self. May God, may we cease to self. May we cease in looking at our abilities, our potential, our wealth, everything, to assume that we have a place. Our victory is in the covenant you gave us. And we choose to trust you. Our qualification is the covenant we have with you. And you who began that good work in our lives, you'll see to accomplishment. Give the Lord a mighty hand of a praise. If you're sick in your body, I speak healing right now. 
start to receive healing now in the mighty name of Jesus now if you've never given your life to Christ today is the best day this is the biggest thing you could ever do if you say I want to give my life to Christ I want to receive that covenant if you know how much he loves you you don't need to be convinced if you are persuaded that God loves you and you want to receive him tonight the Bible says he wills that no man perish repeat these words after me say Jesus I believe that you are the son of God who died for my sins and was raised for my glory tonight I receive you as my Lord and Savior Jesus come into my heart I know you will live there forever my life changes from today I enter a new covenant a new story Amen the message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International for more information contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com you can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still feel free to join us every thursday for our weekly fellowships at uma multipurpose hall from 5 p.m to 8 p.m you can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash fenero fenero make manifest <laughs>